Good afternoon, and welcome to our event, The Future of Independent Agencies, Fallouts from Problems at the Federal Trade Commission. I'm Mark Jamison, a non-resident senior fellow with AEI. Much of American life is overseen by so-called independent government agencies. There's no clear definition as to what we mean by independent agency, but they tend to be agencies that are not under direct control of the White House. By one count, there are more than 50 such agencies, including the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, who oversees a growing number of ways that consumers manage their finances, and the Federal Communications Commission, which oversees commercial wireless, communication services, broadcasting, and some broadband deployment. That, what brings us here today are recent events at the FTC. In normal times, the FTC is a five-member commission that operates as a collegial body at arm's length from the White House, with open debates and disagreements, as well as unanimous decisions. Its objectives, based on statutes and common law, have been about protecting consumers, high-quality products with low prices, efficiency and innovation, and not unduly burdening legitimate business activity. But the Biden administration has not been normal times. Administratively, the FTC is in disarray. Many career staff have recently left, and those remaining are mostly demoralized. Information wasn't being shared with the two Republican commissioners who are now gone. The agency is operating beyond its authority, according to some agency veterans. Its vision has been narrowed from that long list of consumer-oriented market outcomes that I just described to fair competition, at least according to the FTC's website. It has embarked on a rulemaking spree, a failed strategy in past times, on such topics as data collection, employee non-compete agreements, and television advertising. Power has been shifted from the commissioners to the chairperson's office. Zombie votes were used to reverse merger policies. Norms for commissioner recusal from votes have been ignored. Defendants have been refused information about their cases and the chairperson seems to want to unilaterally rewrite a court-ordered consent decree. According to press reports, former White House advisor Tim Wu has explained that the chairperson's appointment and her agenda of rolling back years of legal precedents were part of a plan to impose a new antitrust philosophy even if Congress and today's judiciary disagree. And we haven't begun to talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But this all raises questions. Is independent regulation in the U.S. operating under law, as theory tells us it should? Are today's regulatory decisions at arm's length from day-to-day -day politics? Are administrative procedures helping ensure substantive decisions, or are ideology and informal collegial networks determining directions? And if there are problems, are Congress and the courts up to the task of holding agencies accountable for laws and process? These are troubling questions for those of us who've been involved in the research of understanding that economies thrive best when regulations are transparently governed by rule of law. So here to discuss these issues are regulatory leaders and scholars that have invested heavily in ensuring regulatory quality and accountability. With us is Maureen Olhausen of Baker Botts, She's a former FTC commissioner and acting chairperson, where she directed all aspects of the FTC's antitrust work and steered its consumer protection enforcement. She regularly attended the U.S. delegation in international, led the U.S. delegation in international antitrust and data privacy, and is the only FTC commissioner to have received the Robert Petofsky Lifetime Achievement Award. Her practice focuses on antitrust, privacy and data security, and consumer direction, protection. Also with us is Mike O'Reilly. He's replacing Ajit Pai on our panel. Mike was a commissioner at the FCC and is currently principal at MP O'Reilly uh, Consulting LLC and visiting fellow at the Hudson Institute Center for Economics of the Internet and a senior fellow at the Media Institute. He also served in various roles on Capitol Hill. His tenure at the FCC was noted for its innovative work on the digital divide, restoring internet freedom, promoting 5G, and improving transparency and economic rigor in FCC decision making. Then we have Adam White, a senior fellow with AEI, where he focuses on the Supreme Court 
and the administrative state. Concurrently, he co-directs the Antonin Scalia Law School's C. Boyd and Gray Center for the study of the administrative state. He's a regular contributor to many law journals, media outlets, and has provided numerous testimonies before Congress and served on Biden's presidential commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Maureen, Mike, and Adam, welcome. I have a few questions for each of you, uh, but around 310, we're going to open the floor for questions from our audience. For those of you that are watching online, if you have questions, please email them to jake.easter at aei.org or tweet them with the hashtag AskAEITech. Again, the email is jake, J-A-K-E, dot Easter, like the holiday, at AEI.org, and the tweet hashtag is A-S-K-A-E-I-T-E-C-H. So, Maureen, let me begin with you. So we're using the FTC as our jumping off point for this particular event. What was normal like at the FTC, and what held those norms in place? Great. Uh, well, thank, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here to speak on, on this topic. Um, so my experience at the FTC, so I was there, I had been a staff member for a number of years, then I was head of the Office of Policy Planning, then I was uh, a Republican commissioner nominated in the Obama administration, and then I served as the um, acting chair for a year, first year and a half of the Trump administration. So I've seen the FTC you know, many, many different ways. I've served with a bunch of other, other commissioners. And one of the things that the FTC was really noted for starting, I think, kind of in the mid-'80s uh, till about very recently, um, was it was a, um, a bipartisan, fairly collegial body. And, and by statute, no more than three commissioners can be from the same political party. And it was created that way with the idea of trying to have an expert body that would give a, a bipartisan approach, a body of experts, uh, use its administrative litigation, use its uh, federal court, its policy making functions, uh, to come up with, I think, a, a, um, a more bipartisan approach to competition and consumer protection issues. So as an example of that, when I mentioned I was the acting chair of the FTC, and at the time, I only had one other colleague, uh, Terrell McSweeney, who was a Democrat. And you would have thought that that would be a recipe for total gridlock in Washington, you know, one Republican, one Democrat, you know, for, eight, for 18 months. And actually, because of the common ground that the FTC had built over the years, the consensus, we were able to function very well, staff was very happy, we brought a, a lot of cases, we were very successful in our cases and in our outcome. There are a couple things that she and I disagreed on and we would have our disagreements and we would move forward. Uh, but I think that really marked how the FTC was known, was known for operating. But one of the reasons why the FTC had developed in that way is looking back. So in the 1970s, the FTC actually had a lot of disagreements on rulemaking, actually. That was one, one of the issues uh, that caused Congress to be very, very unhappy with the agency. The agency was shut down. The agency was defunded. Um, and it had a real impact. I think, on the thinking of the people at the FTC and the people who came, came after that to say, we need to have um, you know, a, a bipartisan approach, a consensus approach. It needs to be tied to what the core mission of the FTC is, which is to prevent unfair and deceptive acts or practices. That's its consumer protection authority. And Congress defined what unfairness meant because of the excesses of this rulemaking. Um, and then to use uh, consumer, um, its competition authority in a way that uh, reflected uh, consistency with the Department of Justice, consistency where, where the courts were going. Um, so I think those were hallmarks of how the FTC operated rather efficiently and effectively for a number of years after learning that very, very hard lesson uh, in, in the 1970s. All right. So... Well, I'm going to ask each of you specific questions. If you have something else you want to chime in on on any of the other questions I ask, please, please do so. And I want to spend some time on what kind of holds norms in place, because I, I talk to a lot of countries around the world about regulation, and that is something that they're always working on. How do they develop good norms and hold them? 
Um, Mike, but I'm going to turn to you next. So you provided leadership in an independent regulatory agency. You and your colleagues did a lot of work on transparency, rigor, accountability in the decision making. Tell us about your experiences, please. Well, uh, for anyone who turned in to see Ajit Pai, my, my friend, uh, I'm a poor substitute, so I apologize from, from that perspective. And, and a couple of things that you might not know about me, when I was first approached about this, becoming an FCC commissioner, it was a job I actually didn't get. Um, my Ajit, got, Ajit Pai got the job, but I was talking to the leader, Republican leader's office at the time, also about the FTC, which would make more sense. So I think I actually fit um, the panel of what we present today because I had done a ton of work on the House um, Energy and Commerce Committee on privacy and dorm dormant co commerce clause, internet commerce, a lot of really interesting work that was kind of, uh, that, that's now very ripe and, and carried that through into my Senate days and it wasn't until one of my bosses last, lost a re-election that I kind of um, looked at potentially becoming a commissioner uh, and fitting that role. Um, and, and, and another data point I would I, I'd lend to you is that Maureen and I had lunch occasionally um, in our different roles, you know, and we'd kind of compare notes. And I, I remember telling her at one point, I said, the FTC is probably about five years behind the FCC in terms of where it is, in terms of a lightning rod, in terms of how it's approached by DC, how, how the activities, the process, the procedures, what, you know, how uh, hot button issues are approached. Um, and, and the collegiality that was very prevalent at a time, uh, the FTC didn't really carry over to the FCC. Um, now, so with that background, my, my, I spent 20 years on Capitol Hill. I got to see how agencies abused the statute. I got to see how agencies abused their own procedures and other commissioners. And I took that knowledge to the FCC and worked really hard to try and propose ideas when I was in the minority and then in the majority that would help improve the um, some fatal flaws in the institution. And I want to be careful here. Uh, many of the practices of the current um, administration at the FCC, my good friend Jessica Rosenworcel, uh, I have nothing bad to say about her. Th to me, the flaws are about the institution. And a lot of the norms that are being practiced today were abused many years ago, uh, and now we're catching up. The FTC actually has, is, is like I said, it's behind um, in terms of the history. And now you're seeing some of the norms being abused. And in future administrations, you're bound to see it not be about the person, but the institution as much. I don't know Lena Khan. Um, but, but, you know, I remember past, um, I read Hunt or, 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 or Kevin Martin or a number of different commission chairmen at the FCC who had abused the process. So I probably put forward 60 ideas, excuse me, over my time to try to improve the process at the FCC. And I probably got a you know, handful through. We now publish the, idea, the items before they're actually voted on so people can actually look at them um, when at the same time the commissioners get them. So there's a lot of things you can improve. Um, but there's some things that, ne that never made the, the light of day and would really improve the institution. And, and, and it, you know, procedures really matter to me. We, you know, Ronald Reagan's uh, old uh, personnel uh, official used to say, personnel is policy. And I actually think it's personnel and procedures are policy now. Um, and, and they really matter. And they really change how you approach um, the, the institution and how things get done. We had many collegial opportunities at the FCC, worked with my colleagues on a lot of things together, but at the same time, the hot button issues are, are you know, you could read the history of how uh, trouble and tormented they were um, and, and how they were approached. Uh, so many times, abuses that didn't need to be done on timing, on, on sleight of hands, on information not being shared with other commissioners, very prevalent idea, things that were not necessary to run a, run a good ship. And, and, and I think that those things um, are all things that need to be improved. Again, it's the institution necessarily, not the individuals um, who, who, you know, because the norms have grown um, and precedent has been set for so long. And we've got, you know, we'll get into it a little bit more. There's a recent case at, at, at the FCC involving Standard General um, that, that will kind of highlight how we got, you know, the latest kind of uh, abuse in my mind, which will kind of tie nicely, I think, with, with some of the other experiences. So I'll leave it there to start. So it impresses me as I listen to us talk about this that we have these kind of, we're talking about norms. There are formal norms, things that are in the laws, uh, whether it be statutes, common law, procedure, administrative procedures. But then there's a lot of informal norms, things that are about the people. It seems like we're leaning very heavily on, on these, these kinds of informal norms of, of the qualities of the individuals in the seats, the leadership that people provide. 
Are we doing too much of that, do you think? And, and should there be more concrete laws that hold things in place? What, what are your thoughts on this? Anyone? I absolutely, uh, absolutely support uh, Congress writing really strict statutes. I actually think there's very value, and I've testified to this fact, that it'd be helpful to tell the agencies what they're not to do. They're very good at kind of telling them what to do and then leaving broad hope, that, you know, hope the agency, I helped write statutes when I was there, and you, you hope that they're gonna do the right thing. Well, we've seen agencies and parts of the administration um, recreate the statute in their own vision, um, you know, absolutely outside the bounds of what was expected, and, and that shouldn't be in my mind. So I'm, I'm for a Congress that provides very good specificity, exactly what they want uh, to an agency. Marine Adam, yeah, I, I think it would make sense for Congress uh, to provide further guidance to the FTC for how it's going to carry out its mission. Uh, one of the cases where I'll probably cover this uh, is the Axon Supreme Court case, 9-0 case, that said that the, FTC, the constitutionality of the FTC's authority, which uh, the FTC can bring, uh, vote out a complaint, bring an enforcement action, then it gets tried in front of an administrative law judge, and then that decision gets appealed back to the commissioners. There is a serious question at issue now about whether that uh, is a constitutional structure. Uh, and a lot of the kinds of decisions and actions that the FTC is starting to take, I, I think you know, we're in a different world uh, of how the courts, in particular the Supreme Court, is looking at these things and saying, does the FTC have this authority? Where is it in the statute? How is that clear? separation of powers, non-delegation, major questions. These are all you know, hot button issues before the su Supreme Court uh, that the FTC with a very vague statute and now sort of using it in ways that I think start to raise a lot of hackles, um, it would really benefit from greater clarity from, from, the, from the court. One thing that I used to say um, when I ran the FTC um, was because the FTC is, was, is a relatively small agency. Um, and um, it kind of covers a lot of, a lot of ground, as I used to say, avoid doing things that unite your enemies, right? Because that's what happened to the FTC in the 70s. Um, it took these steps and it brought together a huge swath of American industry that went and complained to Congress and the agency almost didn't survive. Uh, so I think having better clarity from Congress, better foundation for these steps that it wants to take would really benefit the FTC and probably all um, administrative agencies right now, given the direction of the court. Yeah. I have no shortage of thoughts on the substantive legal issues, but let me just say on sort of the procedures and norms within the agencies, maybe I'd analogize it to this. Are there any baseball fans in the audience? So anybody who watches baseball now knows that this year, Major League Baseball had to change a lot of rules, right? They had to put pitchers on a clock so they couldn't just wait forever. They stop, had to stop the outfield or the infielders from shifting all over the field. Um, they, they had to do a number of changes just to kind of restore some order. Little by little, pitchers were taking longer to pitch. Uh, batters were stepping out of the batting box. Infielders were moving all over the field. And it just stopped being the game that it originally was. At some point, baseball has to step in and write these new rules that are basically just returning things to what the old norms were. And in some ways, that's what we're seeing with, uh, with the independent agencies. The basic norms, the collegiality that there used to be, it's breaking down in many ways and for several reasons. But sometimes what it takes is somebody to come in, whether it's the commissioners themselves or Congress legislating on the commission, just trying to bring people back to the, the expectations there were before that alone might allow the agency to act more collegially. They can begin to learn to trust one another, to cross party lines more. But right now what you're seeing is the tail end of years of mutual distrust that results in just sort of tit for tat uh, that you end up having to legislate against just to bring things back to where they were. And I promise that's the only baseball analogy of the day. <laughs> well. <clears throat> So I'll, I'll turn to you in a moment on, on, the, uh, on the formal rules. I just wanted to add, based on what you all were saying, uh, the research center I direct at the University of Florida uh, spends a lot of time, as I'd implied earlier, with countries around the world talking about how regulation should work. When we started that effort, we focused on economics. We were all pretty much economists. We focused on law. We focused on finances. Can you get all these things right? What we found out very quickly that when a country establishes regulation and focuses just on those issues, things still spin out of control. 
that there are a lot of people issues that you have to deal with. So we actually now have a director of leadership studies that helps people with that. How do you mobilize people to do very difficult things and to work well together in doing it? It's, it's, um, it's an integral part, it's an important part, but if we have to figure out what are those lines are between what's formal and what's informal. So Adam, let me turn a little bit more to the formal systems. Sure. Um, under we've had for some time a Chevron doctrine, yep. which gave the agencies fairly wide discretion yeah. as to what their authority was. Yeah. Um, recent Supreme Court case has started pushing back on that. Explain this to us, please, and where you think things are going. Yeah, um, and I know there's a big Supreme Court decision out this morning involving the EPA and Army Corps. I haven't gotten to read it yet. Um, for all I know, there's a bunch of Chevron stuff in there that I haven't seen yet. Um, for the last 40 years, the courts under the leadership of the Supreme Court have told agencies, sorry, have told courts to be deferential to agencies' interpretations of the law. Congress writes these laws in broad terms. There's a lot of policy discretion in there, uh, and the, court, the Supreme Court has said since the mid-'80s, in these areas, just defer to the agency's reasonable interpretation of the law. Let the policymakers be the policymakers. And Justice Scalia was always one of the great champions of this. He said, uh, as long as Congress is writing broad laws, we should let elections have consequences and that when a new president is elected, the new administration can react to the election and, and reinterpret laws accordingly. He, he saw that as a, as a good thing in our system. But you can have too much of a good thing. And even Scalia knew that if agencies started flip-flopping wildly from one administration to the next in policy, in significant policies, you get terrible uncertainty. Even Scalia, the, like I said, the biggest defender of Chevron deference, warned about this. Uh, in, in a famous article he wrote for Duke Law Journal. In the last 10 years or so, the court clearly recognizes we are now in that place where each new administration on issues ranging from climate policy, net neutrality, now we're seeing it with antitrust, you're getting huge swings in policy from one administration to the next. And a number of the justices have expressed some concerns about this. Thomas and Gorsuch are very worried about the breadth of, dele we call it delegation, the, the breadth of powers that are delegated to agencies by Congress. Roberts seems particularly worried about the flip-flop problem and the fact that you do get such uncertainty from one administration to the next. And so the court, through a few doctrines, uh, what's called the major questions doctrine and some other procedural cases, the court, sometimes the conservative justices, sometimes Roberts with the more liberal, with the liberal justices, uh, they are trying to slow down the pace of change. And I don't necessarily agree with every aspect of what they're doing, but I do think it's a good thing because what we're seeing in the last few years is the weaponization of legal uncertainty. It's one of the real themes coming out of especially the FTC, but not just the FTC. That, um, the, say, the current leadership of the FTC, the, the, the chairwoman, Lena Khan, she clearly recognizes that you don't need to create new regulations, uh, let alone new legislation to prevent mergers and acquisitions. You can do it through uncertainty. You can do it by taking down old guidance documents and replacing them with new guidance documents that actually give less guidance than before. It's almost like unguidance. You can do it by filing lawsuits, knowing that you're going to have a low probability of success in actually winning the case. But that's not the entire point. Part of the point is just raising the, the regulatory risk around M&A activity. You're seeing that especially in the FTC, but in a few other places at the SEC and elsewhere, especially with capital intensive industries, uh, the, the regulators at the EPA and elsewhere. They know that they can deter what they want to deter, not through agency action, but more through um, almost sort of passive aggressive activities. Um, and the challenge in this is that administrative law isn't really well geared to respond to that. Uh, I know Maureen's taught at the Scalia Law School before. I, I used to teach there as well. Um, you're not a recovering professor too, are you? No. Um, and, and of course, Dr. J is. I've never gotten over it. <laughs> but um, administrative law, as it's taught in the, in the textbooks in class, it's pretty straightforward. Agency does something. You file a law lawsuit to challenge it. The courts decide. It's a pretty straightforward process. But the courts and that body of law, they're not well geared to situations where the agency is either refusing to do something, like approve something, grant a permit, where they're creating uncertainty but not through new regulations. 
The Roberts Court is really coming to grips with this, and the lower courts too, and I think we're going to see some very interesting doctrinal reactions out of the courts in the next 10 years. Okay, so Mike and, and Maureen, so what Adam has teed up is, as I would understand it, kind of regulation by increasing uncertainty or regulation by making dealing with the regulatory agency really expensive. And, and so kind of directing people, moving people those, in those ways. Um, so I want to deal with, with two issues on that. So Maureen, I'm going to ask you first. Michael, I know when you were at the FCC, you had to make a decision about how far you would change something that the previous uh, uh, commission had done. But Maureen, so we've, Adam brought up some cases. Uh, you and I have talked about some cases, a Walmart case, uh, a Meta case. There are some others that come to your mind where the FTC is losing cases. It could be any regulatory agency losing cases, but maybe strategically. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's an interesting strategy. Um, I think it's kind of a twofold strategy from the way uh, the leadership has articulated it. One is definitely this idea of deterrent. Uh, they actually talk about this expressly. So uh, one of the FTC's roles, and it shares this with the Department of Justice, is um, HSR, Hart Scott, Hart Scott Rodino Merger Review. <coughs> Uh, and it's got a strict time period under the statute, and if the agency doesn't take action, the party, if it's for mergers above a certain size, the parties can close the transaction. Uh, the FTC or DOJ can issue what's called a second request. When they get one of these um, huge, huge document, can be huge, huge document requests. Um, but if the time period expires, uh, the, uh, the parties can still close the transaction. Um, and typically, that would have been a like, okay, well, you know, the, the review is done. So the FTC has done uh, several things. One is they started issuing letters called the, where they'd say, well, we're not done with our review, but the time period has expired, so you're closing at your own risk, mm -hmm. right? Maybe we're going to come back and see you la later. You know, that was really uh, unheard of. Now, HSR clearance doesn't, it's not an approval. It doesn't actually mean they can never come and sue you, but it was traditionally presume that if the review period expired, you were free to close your deal. So they created more uncertainty that way. Uh, reports are that the agencies are taking longer to review deals, that they're asking for a wider range of information, that they're asking for different types of information, not focused um, specifically on consumers and the impact on consumer welfare, but they're asking about labor, they're asking about other issues. This makes it much more uncertain, makes it much longer. Um, and so, you know, with mergers, so often there is a lot of uncertainty to get the deal reviewed within a certain time period to hold the financing together. So the more you push this out and make it uncertain, the more you can deter people from entering it to begin with. Now, ironically, um, it may not be the anti-competitive mergers that are being deterred. It's the ones that are marginally beneficial, right, where the parties say, well, you know, this will this acquisition or whatever, this will be like a, you know, a useful thing to have. It's not a must have. It's kind of helpful. Um, but it's not really worth the, the uncertainty, the how long a deal may be dragged out or, you know, kind of what other things they might try to, to look at. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges that, that we're seeing on the merger side. Um, and we saw the Meta Within challenge, which you know, wasn't, wasn't successful. Um, one thing that I do want to mention, though, because I think there is this idea like, oh, this is you know, just a strategy, and we'll get this deterrence um, overall. A lot of that, I think, is being based on the idea uh, that they've expressed, which is skepticism about the benefits of mergers to begin with. Right? The idea that it's better, that if there's a preference for things to actually be done organically in-house, not to be done through acquisition. Uh, Chair Khan has said that ex ex expressly. Uh, if there's no impact on competition, um, there really is no basis in law for that, for that presumption. But there is this sort of idea. Um, and I think some of it is based on, on this assumption or, or presumption that they've made that mergers don't actually result in benefits, that they don't uh, create efficiencies. Um, so I actually have a paper coming out where I did a big literature review to show that there are studies that actually document merger efficiencies. The, you know, they're a little hard to measure, um, but there, and most mergers aren't 
justified on the basis of efficiencies. That's rarely accepted as a defense. Anti-competitive mergers aren't justified on the basis of efficiencies. It's very rarely accepted in courts. Um, but I think they're, they're starting from this presumption that mergers really aren't a good thing. So if we deter them across the board, that's OK. Um, and I think that, that um, isn't, there really isn't a good, a good grounding for that. On the consumer protection side, Look, the FTC has, I talked about the 1970s and the rulemaking, which was, on, was called KidVid. It had to do with advertising of sugared cereals to children, um, where the FTC got you know, defunded and struck down and all, and all these things. Uh, after that, the FTC really repositioned to focus much more on fraud, much more on you know, fraudulent actors, money being taken from consumers, or health care fraud, things that really, you know, very tangible harms to consumers. Um, and, but we're seeing a movement away from that now. Uh, there, are very, you know, there are fewer fraud cases being brought at, at the FTC these days, um, which I think you know, is, is kind of an interesting um, thing. Christine Wilson, when she was commissioner, talked about some of, the, some of these issues. Um, and, and I'll just finish with the idea of opportunity costs. Right. When we're looking at their, their, you know, the FTC is using its limited resources to um, engage in much longer reviews for mergers that aren't anti-competitive or to chase down you know, behaviors that aren't um, creating like real tangible consumer harm. It means they're not using those resources to bring other cases. And there are always, always good cases to be brought, both against anti-competitive behavior and against fraudulent behavior. So I, that's another thing that I think is not really being brought up much. What isn't being achieved as they're trying to sort of push the boundaries? OK, so Mike, similar question for you. Uh, you were uh, in, involved in changing a direction. The issue was net neutrality, where the, uh, the commission under Obama had made one decision, you and your colleagues once the Republicans were in the majority, made a, a very different decision. So two things with that. One is you had to weigh the balances of uncertainty versus a policy direction you thought was correct. But then also, I'd, I'd be curious, would you have liked for Congress to have weighed in and just said, here's, here's the decision? So could you talk about both of those, please? Oh, so the last part of your question, absolutely. Um, even if I thought the Congress went the wrong direction, um, I, you know, and, and it has recently on some issues, I didn't agree with the outcome, but they at least settled the matter, right? You say broadband grants, for instance, they've given to NTIA over the FCC. I testified beforehand, I thought the FCC was the better institution. I wasn't, you know, my views didn't win the day um, and the money went to NTIA. But Congress answered the question. And on net neutrality, I would have loved them to have, and, and when I was a staffer, I advocated for that. Um, and when, when I was a commissioner, I advocated for that as well. So providing guidance from, Con or providing specificity from Congress would have been really helpful. Um, and, you know, actually, you know, Part of the reason, uh, at least my justification, if you look back on, on my decision making, um, you know, why we went from you know, where Tom Wheeler led the agency to where G. Pai led the agency on net neutrality uh, is, is my belief in terms of what was rooted in the statute. You know, what did Congress ask us to do? What did they prevent us from doing? And how did this match up with the current marketplace? Now, we talked about new statutes and how, spe how specific they can be. In many instances, the FCC is using old statutes. A lot of the times, they're from the 27 Act uh, that then morphed into the 34 Communications Act. And so the language is incredibly broad. And that's when you had belief in the institutions um, amongst you know, legislators and others, the public, that doesn't necessarily exist today. Um, and, and that, that breaks down. And I was trained uh, from, you know, from my time as in, a, as, as in the chairman's office on the House Energy and Commerce Committee to my time on Senate Commerce working for different members. I remember uh, Ted Stevens giving a speech. I'm sure many of you, have, you can see the video when he would talk about the FTC. And he would say, there used to be seven commissioners. And then the 70s hit. And he was very clear you know, what he expected, what, the, what those members expected out of a commissioner and out of the institution. Um, you had boundaries. You had statutes written. They were to decide rather than, than, the, than the institution or the commissioners themselves. And so I would have been happy on that neutrality. And we're, we're now facing the p potential that this will you know, flip again. Uh, in this administration on net neutrality. And that, that to me, is, is a problem. Um, the cases, the, the situations don't match up anymore, but they're so wedded to the beliefs of, of, of the politics, of the substance, 
uh, that, we, that we can't get past that. The, the, the case doesn't fit anymore, from my perspective, to, to what people wanted to do, and, the, and it's morphed what net neutrality means to it, you know, over the years. So, so all of that is, you know, set that aside, uh, you know, in, in my mind, if Congress could just say, this is what we expect, and here's what you should do on this case. Now, if they can't come to agreement, well, that, you know, the institution should recognize that and stop trying to play legislator, in my mind. Okay. So I want to explore an issue that all of you have brought up, and that is Congress could provide more concrete laws, could provide some current decisions and directions. And I'm curious as to why, why doesn't it? So Adam, I'm first going to ask you, but I'm sure Mike and Maureen probably have some thoughts as well. What, what holds Congress back from saying net neutrality means this and yes or no on it? Okay, so there are some, some, I think, reasonable reasons why they would want to punt it to the agency. Some issues are extremely complicated technically. They might involve fast-changing technology, and Congress would rather see a, a more nimble framework. Uh, that's the nicest thing I'm going to say about any of this. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line in The Federalist where Madison's talking about the constitutional institutions, and he says, you know, the interests of the man need to be attached to the rights of the place, right? The people in office, they should have their powers really rooted in the, 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 the their, their incentives rooted in the powers of the institution they're working in. Um, and today, if you're in Congress, most of the rights of the place are oversight, right? Congress has any number of occasions for oversight. They can have hearings, and frankly, there's more political bang for the buck now in hearings than in legislating. Uh, this, I think, came about in part because over time, Congress delegated little by little or a lot by a lot, decade by decade, to a point where they gave away so much power, they had even more to oversee. And so it's in some ways natural, and not necessarily in a great way, that Congress would be geared towards oversight. The, the, tip, the tipping point in this, frankly, was we just celebrated the 75th anniversary of the Administrative Procedure Act. It was quite a celebration. Um, the same year that Congress re enacted the APA, they enacted the Legislative Reorganization Act, where Congress reorganized itself to really be primarily an oversight first body. And that was in 46. Everything since then has compounded Congress's incentives in favor of doing oversight instead of legislation. And frankly, in the current media environment where oversight hearings give, give rise to better YouTube clips and, 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 and uh, Twitter video clips and so on, it makes sense that Congress would want to focus on those things. But the, the sad thing is that now at this point, they've probably lost not just the incentives on actually legislating, but also the, the political institutional muscle memory for doing it as well. And so getting Congress out of that rut, out of that cul-de-sac, is going to take some real effort. It's going to take some effort by reformers like Congressman Gallagher, who's written a, a few pieces on the need to really rethink what Congress is doing from the inside. And I think a lot of the Supreme Court's efforts in issues like the major questions doctrine are efforts to nudge Congress back into action by channeling political um, energy away from the agencies back into Congress. Uh, we'll see if it works. Michael, you were in the trenches yep. writing legislation, oversight of, of these independent agencies. What are your thoughts? Well, look, I, I don't, I still think Congress legislates, and certainly the institutions that I most, or the parts that I mostly deal with, energy and commerce, Senate commerce, for instance, that, you know, Energy and commerce has moved, you know, upwards of 50 bills on telecom in the last you know, many months. So they can still legislate. They still have that 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 experience. I do think there's a factor that, and I agree with Adam. There is more attention um, on some of the the YouTube clips and some of the Twitter, uh, and it happens into the agencies as well. And there's probably an ability, you know, a desire to cut back on some of that. We also, you know, there, the, when I was leaving the institution in the last two years. As a staffer, there was you know a breakdown of interaction between the administration um, and the you know the other party. There wasn't as much interaction as as, as early on in my career, and, th and that needs to be probably repaired. And that's been harder. You get a little bit tribalism. It happens when elections are really close, and the, the breakdown is you know really close in the Senate and the House, and you have the parties you know or majority switch. Um, uh, it takes a little bit of time to settle the ground on that. In the meantime, the agencies don't stop. Um, you know, absent a, a change in the administration itself. So um, it, it requires work from, from uh, 
from the institution. It requires Congress to re-engage, and they are. They're moving reauthorization bills to try and address some of these things. But to, to your point, it's hard to get uh, attention on process. I, I worked hard to get attention when I was a commissioner on reforms to the FCC process, and I was probably successful. There, there were different bills introduced. They couldn't get across the threshold. Uh, they couldn't quite get there. But they were in. They were definitely. They definitely changed the debate of the institution. The, they, the commissioners are very attuned to what's happening on Congress, in Congress, and what you know is going to be expected of them, and whether it be through hearings or legislation or even meetings from members, they, they do know that very well. You knew when someone was going to call you up and, and, and ask you questions. You you were you were prepared to uh, address what 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 you how you decided something and why you you know you grounded your reasoning and be able to explain yourself or be prepared to to act if necessary. Marie, you've had experiences with the oversight, and in a I'd like to know kind of how that affected the boundaries of your organization. But I'm also curious, I've, I've talked with lots of regulators around the world, and I've found them taking positions everywhere from, I never talk about laws or policies with the, with the policy makers, because that's their job, I just talk about regulation, to those that say, this parliament doesn't know what it's doing, I need to tell them what the laws should be. How did that all work out for you? So, I, I, look, I think there's a careful balance that needs, that needs to be struck, which is you know, Congress you know, oversees, right? Congress has the purse springs. Congress has you know, the, the authority. They can call you up <laughs> there, you know, and you have to explain yourself as you should. Um, what it shouldn't be doing is telling, or, uh, and same for the administration, shouldn't be telling you particular outcomes in particular cases, right? Um, you know, often there'd be like, oh, you know, let this merger through or stop that merger or something, you know, that, that I think is, is not uh, an appropriate role, role for, for Congress. But um, I think that, you know, as, as an agency, um, to be showing respect to Congress, respect that Congress is the one that makes these decisions as a source of authority is, is really, really important. Um, to getting support from Congress and to just kind of keeping on, on the, you know, kind of the, not going off the rails, uh, I think. Uh, but one of the challenges that I think, um, and uh, both um, Mike and Adam sort of talked about some of the reasons why Congress is having trouble legislating, it creates this pressure then to use a vague statute like the FTC Act to get things done that Congress should really be doing. So, for example, um, it's long past due for there to be a federal privacy law uh, in, in the U.S. The FTC has, you know, talked about this. I've testified on the Hill about it a number of times, um, and you know, Congress just hasn't done it, hasn't done it yet, even though there's a lot of support for that. Um, so I think there's a temptation for the agency to try to step into the breach and do that through some rulemaking or or something like that. On the antitrust side, there was a lot of bills um, that were introduced on antitrust issues that didn't get passed. Um, but I think there is this temptation to say, well, the FTC, you know, maybe it's got this rulemaking authority that, gee whiz, has never really used on <laughs> for 100 years, um, at least not solely, for unfair methods of competition. So now that's going to be the tool, and Chair Khan is a big fan of that. Um, to enact things that they, you know, wish Congress should do, and let's not forget the states preempt the state, right? So, sort of, in a way, take even a further step to say, well, we're going to become sort of a, a national legislature, um, and you know, Congress often passes laws and doesn't preempt state laws, and now the FTC is deciding, well, it can, like on the non-compete rule, it will preempt all the state laws um, on on non-competes. Um, so I do think that there is this sort of temptation to take action because of frustration of legislatures not, not taking action. Uh, but I think it creates enormous problems of accountability. Right now we have three FTC commissioners. When I ran the agency, we had two FTC commissioners. I don't think you should have a legislature of two or three people making rules, not just federal rules, but apparently preempting state, state laws as well. I think that that ultimately is, is not the way our system was meant to be run. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I think that if 
look, if there could be a federal privacy law passed, I think that would help a lot. Um, but um, just frustration is not a grounds to say, well, now we're just going to kind of take that vague language and take it as far as we think we can. I would take yes, go ahead, Mike. You mentioned that you used the word tell. At no point do I believe that a regulator should tell Congress what to do. It may share its views. Mm -hmm. it's certainly, if asked, they should share views, recommend, provide recommendations. And I agree absolutely with Maureen's point. It is respect, respect for the institution. And, and I didn't always see that from everybody that I've ever worked with um, in, in this space. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it is a problem. Um, and and maybe, it's, maybe it's my background and how I, how I uh, was trained in, in my career uh, to get to that kind of respect. And I don't think, I think it's very, very important. Okay, Adam? Just as, as an institutional story in all of this, there's a really interesting paper. It came out recently by the Manhattan Institute's research director. His name is Judge Glock. That's his name, not his office. Um, he wrote, he wrote a, a, a shorter version of it. I can't remember where, but the, the main version appeared in one of the, one of the main poli, po, uh, political science journals. And he traces the history of the FTC and its predecessor, the great granddaddy, great granddaddy of them all, the Interstate Commerce Commission. And he shows how when Congress first created these bodies, these multi-member commissions more than a century ago, they created them to be almost like a jury, like a jury of, of, of almost specialists um, who were there to, to find the law and find the facts in the way that common law judges and juries would find the law and find the facts. The thing is, a lot of that is about, is about the mindset of the commissioner then, right? Are you going in there to willfully make policy and impose it, to tell the public, here's the rules, or are you trying to find the rules? And, and that's why those early commission statutes, and now to this day, they're phrased in terms like the public interest, the public convenience and necessity, um, uh, uh, what's reasonable, what's the, 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 the rate making? Just and reasonable. Just and reasonable rates, right? These were almost like a jury finding facts and finding, a common law judge finding law. And they, I don't know if that, were, they, that was ever really the right way to realistically think about these bodies, but it certainly isn't now that we do, now that we think of them as like willful policy making <laughs> bodies. Um, so that's gonna require kind of like my strained example at the beginning about the baseball rules changing. It's another reason why the rules now, the legislation governing the agencies, needs to change. It needs to change to account for the modern mindset of the, of the commissioner. All right, uh, so that relationship between the policymaking, the lawmaking body, and the regulatory agencies, we could spend some more time on that. Maybe we'll return to it. But I want to, to move on to, again, looking at the agencies from the outside um, so, Mike, I'll begin with you, but Maureen, you're in a similar situation. Michael, in your work now, you give advice to businesses, you give advice perhaps even to people in Congress about how to understand the regulatory agencies, how to interact with them. When you listen to the businesses in particular, how do they define this is quality regulation, this is a quality agency? How does that look in their, their space? Well, I don't know that it's changed that much and, and, you know, throughout my career. What, what they're looking for, and you, in your opening comments did it well, they're looking for transparency. They're looking for um, adherence to rule of law uh, and actually the statute itself. Um, and they're looking for certainty. And so sometimes they may not agree with the outcome, just like I may not agree with the outcome, but they are looking for some clarity. Um, and so the uncertainty is problematic for how you're supposed to, to deal with things, you know. And, and so I think that's, you know, how, what a regulator can do, you know, the value they can add um, to, the, to their function overall, is to bring uh, that, that forward for both the industry side and the consumer side. Um, you, you are not, you can be a called independent regulator, but you're not, you are still answerable to the consumers, you're still answerable to the industry, you're still being judged by your work um, and to, to, to me, I think that's the advice I'm giving. But, uh, but now it's a, a little bit, you know, to, to Adam's point, it's a little bit some of the, the, you know, the personalities of the individual advice of how does this person look upon an issue? What's their interest in, in these, the subject matter, if any? Um, you know, are they, are they care about things that are at the FTC's authority when they work at the FCC? You know, are, are there split kind of mindsets? So there's definitely advice to, to be provided on, on, on how things are looked upon. Marine, you have clients as well. What, what do they think? 
Um, well, you know, it, it's, it's a cha challenging time. So let, let me use, for example, uh, mergers, right? And a, a really good example of when, so when I was the chair of the FTC and I was a commissioner, I always talked about the importance of three values, transparency, predictability, and fairness, right? So you knew what the um, standards were that the agency was going to apply. Um, so that it was clear about it, it was predictable, and it was applied fairly across, across the board. A really good example of that that has um, been in practice for many, many years is the merger guidelines. Right, so we had the, particularly the horizontal merger guidelines, uh, which the FTC and DOJ both applied. First they came out, they were DOJ only a number of years ago, and the FTC hopped on board because they said it's a good idea. Uh, and what they are is they're not law, right? They are guidance about how the agencies evaluate mergers. And they reflect economic learning over time, and they reflect changes um, in interpretation, right? It's the it's, it's really common law kind of approach. So, what is the case law? What are the courts? Um, uh, you know, how do they how do they evaluate the you know the Clayton Act? Um, and so, what we'd seen over time is these guidelines were widely accepted. Uh, they were typically put out on a bipartisan basis. Uh, they were an excellent counseling tool to say like, okay, you want to have a merger, here's how the agencies are going to look at it. And look, there's always fine lines, there's always distinctions, but it was a very good general guide. And they would be updated, you know, periodically, uh, and they were, they were widely accepted. Um, and what we've seen is now the FTC and DOJ, and this was in the President's uh, Executive Order on Competition, said, no, we need to rethink the guidelines. Um, and so they've been in question now for more than a year about what they're going to do. They issued an RFI, the agencies jointly issued an RFI that really put everything in, in question. Uh, so they're citing case law that is typically more than 50 years old, right? So not modern antitrust analysis. Uh, they're really questioning economic basis. Uh, questioning a focus on consumer welfare, questioning efficiency. So everything's sort of up in the air. Uh, and what we're seeing, and we already talked about uncertainty and, and, and deterrence. Um, so um, I think that that you know, is the kind of thing that um, I'm sorry the agencies are moving away from, right? Because mm -hmm. I thought that was such a uniquely valuable tool for counseling clients for what, you know, how a transaction was going to be assessed. And there's a whole lot of follow on stuff from that, like this affects markets, this affects financing, this affects you know many many things, and to have sort of a generally agreed upon approach where you could say like okay here's generally the factors they're going to look at, and here's you know what they say is in or, or out, and they're up to date on the economics, and they're up to date on the case law, to all that sort of be put into question, uh, it just makes it a very difficult environment for counseling. When my research center deals with or talks with you know, different government bodies around the world, um, we always talk with them about how capital markets respond to risk. When, there, when you raise risk, one of two things happen, maybe both. One is capital goes someplace else, or the cost of getting the money in goes up, and that reduces investment, gives, uh, gives you know, less services down the road. And, and so we encourage people to think about when you're in the seat of the regulator, how your decision-making processes affect risk, because that eventually affects, that ultimately affects the consumers um, in your particular country. Um, so we've, we focused a lot on FTC, FCC. Adam, you've made yeah. the point before that the real frontier in administrative power is in the financial agencies. Yeah. Tell us what, what that is and what it's about and, and the implications. Yeah. Um... So last week we had a conference in, in this room focused on OIRA. You know, the office in the White House that oversees the executive agencies doesn't oversee as much the, uh, the independent commissions like the FTC and the, the SEC, the, the FCC. Um, and I told the story about how when, when the Reagan administration first created that office and they had a press conference, uh, my old friend and mentor, the late C. Boyden Gray, he was part of that project. And he, somebody asked him at this press conference, why did you not rope in all the independent commissioners into OIRA. 
like the financial regulators, and, and, and Boyden said, well, this is already a big first step just to be creating this for the executive agencies. And frankly, the other agencies, they're not, they don't quite do as much. They're not really as controversial. Um, so that's the greatest evidence that the past is a foreign country, right? Because right now, the agencies that we focus on the most, actually, the most creative, the most energetic, they are, in this administration, the independent agencies. And that, I think, by the way, is telling about both the agencies and the White House. But to have the, the FTC really leading on policy uh, and, and also the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, to a lesser extent, uh, the Fed and the FDIC and the CFTC. But you're seeing in recent years a lot of political energy on issues beyond just traditional markets regulation. <laughs> you're seeing a lot of political energy in the financial regulators. And I think you see the, the SEC with any number of new rules on, on, on ESG, on climate. Uh, the, F, the, 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 the Fed Board of Governors and the CFTC, they were even, and the SEC were thinking about climate policy. Even in the last years of the Trump administration, you had the Democrats on those, on those agencies, those commissions, saying we ought to do more on climate. At least two reasons for this. One is the financial regulators traditionally have had the least procedural rigor around what they do, at least in the sense of traditional notice and comment um, and, and, and other tools of agency policy making. Financial regulators have often have long done their work through supervision, which is a much more nebulous sort of long-term discussion and, and relationship between the regulators and the regulated, oftentimes a physical presence in the offices of, of, of the bank headquarters and so on. So there's a lot less procedural transparency, procedural checks and balances. But then also, of course, market regulators are an enormous point of policy leverage. Years ago, Daniel Jurgen, who's written all these famous books about energy, he wrote another book called The Commanding Heights about the debate between capitalists, the markets, and, and, and communists' uh, command and control. Well, what we've seen in recent years, actually, is the commanding heights of free markets uh, the commanding heights have a commanding heights of their own, and that's the market regulators. And so starting with climate especially, you're seeing a lot of interest in the Biden administration over leveraging that, uh, that, that to, to make policy through market participants themselves. Now, this isn't totally unprecedented. We've seen this, of course, in healthcare policy through, through private companies' insurance uh, and the regulation of insurance. But here, I think we're seeing not just a change in quantity of effort, but a change in quality of effort. They really are trying. And if it succeeds, I think we're going to see it in many, many other areas. Maybe we're already seeing it already. I think it's one of the most significant legacies already of the Biden administration, uh, along with the, the weaponizing of uncertainty that I mentioned earlier. And I think it, it deserves a lot more attention. Right now, you're seeing scholars and others that are more on the side of the Biden administration saying, listen, market regulators are in the business of regulating risk. These things involve risk. Therefore, it's no big deal. It actually is a very big deal, which is why the administration is focusing so specifically on it. All right, so Mike, I have one more question before we turn to the audience. And it has to do with if, if Congress can't or isn't passing laws that kind of constrain or well, or better define the independent regulatory agencies. What is it that Congress could be doing? Well, I think I alluded to this, and I think Maureen can give you know examples of where members of con Congress are very influential outside just legislating itself, right? I mean, I, I mentioned the fact that you um, were doing your homework if you were getting called by a member of Congress, if you if they were asking you to meet. Um, if they were going to conduct an oversight hearing, if the staff was getting together and asking for a briefing, you were doing your homework and trying to figure out how to you know, potentially lessen the problem if there was one, solve an issue if you could. Um, so I was you know, doing that as a commissioner is what I expected when I was a staffer as well. So there are many tools and levers that Congress and, and their staff have uh, to influence the agencies and get them in a particular direction. Not to the point, um, you know, you don't want them necessarily weighing in, certainly Good, problematic in terms of mergers or you know, uh, in situations like that or where the outcome may be, but in terms of process and what they expect and, 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 where the, and to be able to hear the, the vision of what's happening in their particular district or the state that they, they work on behalf of, that's very influential for, for a regulator from my perspective. And so I loved hearing that, but you, but you would, you would um, 
you wouldn't be surprised to see both Republicans and Democrats when they're getting ready for an oversight hearing with all five commissioners, the FCC or FTC, try and clear the decks of whatever is, you know, they could so they wouldn't be, you know, exposed for delaying this issue or not making a decision over here. Or how did you decide that? You'd have to be able to justify your answer. So there's a lot of tools that Congress has um, and does exercise them at the right times when they think it's appropriate. All right. Adam or Maureen, anything on that? that you would add? No, I think you, okay. <laughs> the voice of experience sums it up quite well. Now, the way we, we talk about it at our research center, we talk with, with other countries, the, the analogy we use when we get people from parliament, people from ministries, and countries will have those as policymakers, and regulators in the room together, we talk about what you want to do at the policy level is keep your nose in the business of regulation, but your fingers out. And so you need to be fully informed as to what's going on in that agency because you have to judge, are the laws right? You have to judge, are the people right? You have to judge, are the systems right? So you have to be fully informed, but it's not your job to be the regulator. And, and so it's that nose in, fingers out, and then we also use that for how the regulators should treat companies. Fully understand the company. We don't want ignorant regulators. That's a dangerous thing. Um, but. You, you want to be fully informed as to what's going on because the decisions, you want to keep your fingers out because it's the business decision to make those. It's the business's problem to make those investment and those operations decisions. Mark, Mark can I throw something sure. in really quick? You've mentioned the international experience a few yes. times and it's very interesting to learn from that. Um, there, are, there are organizations out there, the Eurasia Group is one of them, that as, as you saw sort of markets opening up in other countries, you need a political risk analysis to understand you know, how safe is it to invest in a certain foreign country? A friend of mine focuses on sort of US regulation at one of these institutions, and it seems like a fascinating job. But it's also kind of a worrisome indicator about the state of the rule of law in the United States that you now have these, these institutions that are focused on political risk abroad now having to think about political risk in the United States. And that's not totally unprecedented. I mean, for a long time um, in Washington, there's any number of, well, I, first of all, when I was at, at, at Maureen's now firm, Baker Botts, we used to care, and I'm sure they care even more now, about what are the speeches that are being made by Gary Gensler, Lena Khan, and others, right? You're thinking not just about what are the rules on the books, but you also have to think about the long-term policy equilibrium. It's a really worrisome sign, and frankly, all the, the uncertainty and the focus on like what's, what's a regulator thinking rather than what is she or he actually making into law right now, that has a very bad long-term deterrent effect because companies, as, as Mike said and Maureen said, they're, they're interested in stability and transparency. Well, eventually, they have to start thinking about where, if I'm gonna skate towards the puck, where's the puck gonna be in 10 years, especially if you're in a capital-intensive industry. So if the whole point of things like Chevron and so forth was to allow presidential elections to have consequences, we now have so much uncertainty and so many flip-flops that elections kind of have less consequences because these industries think less about what's happening in the moment and what's going to be, where, where is the number going to stop five years from now, 10 years from now, and sometimes they have to plan for that. I think a lot of, in the energy industry, a lot of companies shrugged off what the Trump administration was doing on an, any number of things because they knew that actually the long-term policy equilibrium was not where the Trump administration was putting it at any given moment in time. And, and that too, I think, is a worrisome trend. Well, don't knock it too much. I yeah. mean, that's actually how I'm making a living these yeah. days, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I'm a scholar, so I dig into the research, and, and the research shows that as you move towards this greater risk in regulation and, and more regulation, the size of the firms increase. Yeah. Uh, because they're the ones that actually deal with it, and that really hurts the entrepreneurship side. Mike, you joke, when I was a, in one of my earlier jobs, when I was in private practice, I gave a talk at a law school about some new energy policy, and I said, this is the Adam White full employment plan. <laughs> and one of my <laughs> colleagues said, you really shouldn't say that part out loud. <laughs> no, but you know, talk, talking ahead. about privacy, mm -hmm. um, when Europe enacted the GDPR, right, their, their privacy regulation, you know, there were economic studies done that showed that it actually, um, a number of the smaller firms uh, in the advertising area oh, exited. Yeah. Right? Yes. Because these like very challenging regulatory environments do favor larger companies who can invest 
who can invest in that. And look, I used to run the competition advocacy program at the FTC when I was head of the Office of Policy Planning. And that's one of the things that you saw. It's a raising rivals cost strategy, right? A, a big player might go in or an entrenched player and say, you know, let's have this regulation that's you know, I'm prepared to uh, comply with it, and the new entrant can't, um, mm -hmm. so it can be an advantage. Yeah, and some of the European Union polit political officials um, were, were very open about the problem that a lot of their entrepreneurs were moving to the U.S. because they couldn't afford to the regulations in Europe at the time. Although well, maybe we'll catch up. <laughs> then they'll go someplace else yet. All right, so let me turn to the audience a little bit before the, the time that I was thinking about it, but um, I want to get to questions. So we'll go here first. I have a couple questions online, so uh, if, if you're online, please email Jake or uh, do the, the hashtag on, on Twitter, and we'll catch your question. Yes. Uh, Mark, thank you for a tremendous panel. Um, just a, a quick note. Uh, Adam's excellent reference to a 25-year-old book now. Daniel Jurgen was using that phrase. It's a Leninist phrase, and he was using it ironically to say globalism and markets won. And I think your point is maybe it's not so ironic. <laughs> what was um, the line about the French Revolution? Uh, Kissinger said, it's too soon to tell. Too soon to tell. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I wanted to back this up and ask a question about governance mm -hmm. and these institutional arrangements that Adam rightly focused us on when it comes to rights of place. And there is a argument made that in the last generation and a half, too many of our presidential appointments have come from uh, it's the same kind of background. People with a lot of legislative experience. They've worked for the right senator. They've worked for the right committee. Or they've grown up in the agency where they go to become a commissioner or a, a uh, administrator or, or whatnot. And I think we have two notable counterexamples here where we have people serving in those roles who did not view their job as being a super legislator. Is the problem more with the types of people we're selecting or the institutional arrangement where there is a culture of we will supplant Capitol Hill? Who would like to address that? Uh, well, l let me just mention one thing at the, at the FTC. Um, uh, you, you mentioned it in your, in your opening remarks. So there was a culture uh, at the FTC, really, as I mentioned, that grew out of the experience in the 70s of being bipartisan, of trying to base uh, decisions on economics and in data and be sort of um, careful about where the, where the boundaries were. Uh, and one of the challenges that we've seen with the new leadership is a lot of FTC staff unhappiness, right? Where the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey um, over several years now um, has really given the leadership of the agency rather low marks compared to very consistently high marks across administration, right? So it didn't swing, you know, a career. Uh, federal employees tend to, uh, you know, not necessarily be Republicans, right? Uh, but what we what we found was over time, whether it was a Republican chair or a Democratic chair, the staff gave them generally high high marks. Um, we that that hasn't that hasn't been the case with with the new leadership. So I think there was a at least at the FTC a culture, a staff level culture of you know, seeing the agency, you know wanting the agency to not get in trouble again, uh, but to still be, be successful. So, I, so the, it, inside the agency, culture can be a good, can be a good thing. Um, and um, though it certainly can also give one a little bit of blinders. And it is always good to sort of mix in some fresh ideas and fresh, fresh blood, which a five-member commission, that's one of the things it's supposed to do. Right is bring these different voices in and share them, and then you you know kind of come to a, a decision, you know that that reflects those. Uh, one of the other changes at the FTC is centralizing power more in the chair's office, which reduces, I think, one of those benefits of having a multi-member agency. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, it depends on the, the individual, right? There are a couple of reasons for it, right? You know, the experience of who's getting picked on, you know, when I first got to the FCC, they're, oh, here's a, a political hack from Capitol Hill. 
Um, and, and I tried to prove that wrong and tried to get in, you know, show that I had, had studied the law and could, could converse in, in, in the agency. It also was who I could hire. Um, and, and part of the difficulty is we have ethics rules and understand why they're there. I'm not shooting at them. But they keep many um, practices or individuals from being able to be hired as a commissioner or staff as well. When I was hiring staff uh, uh, as a commissioner, um, I really had kind of two, two pools to pick from, internal the agency or Capitol Hill. Because if you worked for uh, a particular company, for instance, or a trade association, then you had huge conflicts of interest and couldn't work on the subject matter um, in which you were coming from. Um, and therefore, you were, and, and oftentimes, you would see this. I remember one particular bureau chief, um, you know, in a, in a previous administration, was to, you know transferred from the, his subject matter area to something completely different, and he had to learn the subject completely, you know, a new subject. It was very capable and able, absolutely, to do that. But the value that, that he could have brought on the subject matter he was an expert on was <coughs> lost. And so, if you take those people out of the equation, then you kind of have two pools to pick from. Um, and then it, it's, I actually do believe in the nomination process, and some people may chuckle on that because it's you know, both helped me and, and, and bit me in the end, and that, that's okay. But I also worked on the nomination process on the front end in my old job um, and, and worked on, on nominees and making sure that they picked the best people they could. And, and Congress really did the work that they wanted to. You read through the material, you asked them tough questions, and you went through the process as expected. It's the same thing I saw when I was uh, you know, asked questions by the administration of both parties. Um, that I that I was potentially up for. So I, I think that process actually does work. It may take longer than people would like, um, but you do get to filter out some of the some of the problem areas, and you also get to express from members of Congress certainly how you view the agency, what's the role as it relates to the legislator, and kind of things we already previously talked about. And so hopefully, people um, uh, you know, and oftentimes they would agree with some of my decisions and then object to other decisions. And that's you know, I had bipartisan support. Um, in, my, in my nomination process when there, when there were votes. So I, I appreciated that in, in the committee and elsewhere. So it, it, it depends on the individual, but I think the process can work. Mark, could I jump yes, in on this? Please. So I've been harping a lot on, on the FTC's chair, Lena Khan, and also the SEC's chair, Gary Gensler. And it, I think that shows that actually where they're coming from doesn't necessarily make a difference, right? Lena Khan, she came primarily from academia, and some of the criticism of her has been she's not sufficiently familiar <coughs> With the, the real practicalities of, of the of the issues she's dealing with now, of course, Gary Gensler came from markets. He was a Goldman Sachs, right? And he proves that sometimes familiarity breeds contempt, right? He's very familiar uh, with 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 the industry, and and he wants to make a lot of change. I think ultimately, it's good to have a mix of people on multi-member commissions. There's the bipartisanship requirements, but it's good to have a mix of backgrounds uh, from 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 industry, from other stakeholder groups from the Hill, maybe less so from think tanks and academia. Um, but the one that we might want to add, and maybe Congress could even do this maybe through a, a statutory requirement, is in addition to a bipartisanship requirement, it would be good to have maybe two commissioners on these five-person commissions that came primarily from a state background. right? If you had something like at FERC, uh, if, if there's a great utilities regulator out of Montana, uh, Travis Cavula, he ran Nehruk for a while. It would be really interesting to see him come from Montana and come to FERC and be a regular on, regulator on FERC. Two people with more of a state mindset or background might make for an interesting diversity of views in addition to the other forms of, of, um, of professional diversity that you get on these commissions. Um, again, not, I'm, I'm not to the exclusion of, of others. And frankly, it would probably be difficult to get people to come from their home state to DC for just one term on a multi-member Commission, but I think it would be good for administrations to invest in finding some good people from the, the corresponding state regulatory commissions. Hey, sometimes the state people are out, outstanding, yeah. and I've worked with many of them, and sometimes they're not worth a hill of beans and, and yeah. really set you back <laughs> and make it hard to, to cut, you know, find some, some common ground. It's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag, and, yeah. and God bless. You know, it's, my, my value add on this panel is, is the old adage, like, it works in practice, but what about in theory? <laughs> It probably doesn't work in theory. Or, or maybe having a requirement that one member be an economist. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, you will go find in some other countries that there are specifications like that, it's primarily if they're part-time commissioners as opposed to full-time. It will say one has to be a business person, one has to be an attorney, one has to be an economist, yeah. one has to be an engineer. They will do things like that. But it's primarily if they're part-time. 
And I'm going to start combing the bios of former FCC commissioners to see who the, <laughs> who the former state person yeah. was. All right, Other very good question. This is over here. Um, yeah, hi. This is uh, a question for uh, uh, Ms. Olhausen. Your um, predecessor recently wrote in a New York Times op-ed that she had the, all the authorities she needed to regulate uh, uh, emerging technology such as uh, AI, you know, this uh, generative uh, AI um, software. And, and she, she mentioned a number of risks, uh, you know, that incumbents, uh, incumbent market leaders might try and freeze out uh, uh, smaller startups and other uh, competitors. Do you share her view of that, of those risks, and, and do you think she's right to say that uh, she has, I mean, especially in view of uh, what you've been talking about today, that she has the, those authorities or, or uh, yeah, to do that? So, uh, just to be clear, who wrote this? Uh, okay. Um, so she was my successor. <laughs> You said predecessor, so I just wanted to be sure I wasn't thinking Edith Ramirez wrote a, <laughs> something. Um, uh, look, so the so the FTC Act, it's un, um, it's unfair and deceptive acts or practices authority is supposed to be um, able to be applied to new technologies, right? So deception. So if you you know you make a material misrepresentation to a consumer that they rely upon to their detriment. Um, then the FTC can bring an enforcement action. Um, unfairness, Congress defined unfairness, so it's an act or practice likely to cause substantial injury that's not reasonably avoidable by the consumer and that's not outweighed by countervailing benefits to competition or to consumers. Um, I think really does capture a lot of those kinds of issues and the FTC has use that authority pretty effectively, right? So the, all these authorities predated the internet. They predated cell phones. They predated, you know, lots of new technologies. But focusing, I think, on the harm to consumers has really been a very useful tool for the FTC that takes it outside of whatever the particular technology is. Um, but I think it really does need to be grounded in that and with unfairness, so that's not based on a representation to a consumer. That's based on this substantial injury. The FTC has defined that in the unfairness statement, uh, which has to do mainly with financial injury or you know, really substantial risk like to health or to safety, um, and the ability of consumers to avoid the risk. So if they know what the risk is and they take it on, and another really important part of that weighing is that Congress put in there is taking into account the countervailing benefits, right? There are always risks to new technologies, right? Um, but there are benefits and, you know, often really great, great benefits. Um, and so not sort of neglecting the benefits, not just to consumers of using it, but to competition, right? Because we see whole new forms of competition uh, that are based on new new technologies. So I think you know, putting that together, the FTC has had a pretty good track record of using that quite effectively and on a very bipartisan basis. I really look back to say like Bob Petofsky, who was um, the Democratic chairman in, in the um, Clinton administration, who laid down a lot of I think really good foundation for looking at the internet, looking at you know online advertising and, and things like that. So I think. I think the authorities are there, but they are, they have to meet those boundaries that Congress put in place, particularly for unfairness, um, which is, you know, has this weighing test and this requirement of substantial injury. All right, thank you. I'm gonna to go to this young lady here. Then um, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask a question from, from the internet about political balance within the agencies that contrast the, the questions contrast the FCC and the FTC at this, this moment. But first, you. Um, she has a microphone for you. Oh, hi, this question is for Maureen. I hi, was Mary. wondering <laughs> if you could um, share your thoughts on this rulemaking binge at the FTC, and in particular, the um, recent increase in their use of Section 18 rulemaking and some of the changes they've made to that process. Sure, so, so the FTC, um, so it clearly has authority 
to engage in consumer protection rulemaking, unfair and deceptive acts or practices. Um, Congress specifically gave it that authority in the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, uh, but put a lot of guardrails in place, right? Based on, you know, I had referenced several times this rulemaking problem that the FTC had, had previously. Um, and so one of the reasons the FTC currently is kind of going on, a, you know, real rulemaking um, effort um, is the current leadership thinks it's too hard to win cases, right? They talk about how burdensome it is and that the idea is that they're gonna promulgate a rule and it's gonna make it so much, so much easier. Um, and look, I think targeted, limited consumer protection rules based on, because one of the requirements is that they ha the practice has to be prevalent. Um, and the rule making authority doesn't give the FTC any additional authority beyond preventing what's an unfair deceptive act or practice. So those guardrails are already in place. So to the extent the FTC is trying to use those rules to make it clearer that through case-by-case -case enforcement, they've determined that as an expert body that these, um, or maybe had courts um, you know, um, support that, that these are you know, un, you know, deceptive practices or, un, or unfair practices, I think, I think that's okay. Right. Um, I kind of question the utility, though, of all the rules. I think one of the reasons that they're doing it is because the FTC in the AMG case, uh, the court said it didn't have the ability to get money redressed, so it's been looking for other ways that it can get money. The unfortunate part of doing it through rules and rulemaking is the money doesn't go back to the consumers. It just goes into the Treasury. But, um, but I can understand some of the reasons for that. But where I do get concerned is when it, it becomes an attempt to say, we are going to enact things that we can't get through Congress, that we haven't gotten courts, or that, we, that the FTC doesn't have a lot of experience with, to show that these are prevalent or that these are, are problematic, or that don't meet this unfairness balancing test, like some of their discussion of the surveillance rulemaking. Um, I think you know, we don't know what that rule is going to look like, but I think it really raises some serious issues about can it actually meet the that balancing and that substantial harm and the you know um, avoidability by consumers test that Congress has put in place. Okay, I'm going to put together two questions from from the internet um, about the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission where we are right now. So right now at the Federal Communications Commission, we have two Republican commissioners, two Democrat commissioners, and that the chairperson is receiving lots of praise from her colleagues and from outside that. She's navigating those waters quite well. A lot of things are, are getting done. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission right now is three Democrats. And people are, are wondering, what are we learning from this moment of how, oh, no, part of the question as well, um, we now have a new nominee for the Federal Communications Commission. If, if she's approved, then what happens? So it's, what are we learning from this moment? And where do we think things go from here? What are the risks involved, et cetera? Um, who would like to talk about that, or at least be willing to? I'll, I'll, I'll start, sure. Um, I think, it, it, you know, you're absolutely right. The commission is still, the FCC is still functioning. Uh, most of the items are approved for all votes, so everyone's on board, not always, but generally it's to be the case. Um, I think what it's proving is that if you have a, a balance, you know, equal number, then you can't um, tilt it in a particular direction. Um, that's not how the statute reads today. It's supposed to be three members of the basically the, the president's party um, and and two from from the opposite side so so it's it's structured for that you you get to some conclusion I think over time what it has led to um, and having a three two structure is more as Maureen said um, you, you condense power within the chairperson's office um, and, and you know you get less of that in a tied commission but I've also worked when there were Two Republicans and one Democrat, and so the different formulations can can work. It's it's a little bit more about personalities and the desire to to get things done. I think than than necessarily the numbers. There are pieces of the uh, that we're expecting. You mentioned net neutrality earlier. We talked about that will probably be back in the in the sphere uh, with a full Democratic slate of commissioners. And I you know I suspect there'll be um, you know things that I wouldn't exactly agree upon. Um, and it won't be as, as bipartisan a after the case, but that's how Congress structured it. Okay, Adam Marie, you want to jump in on this? So, you, when you have 
an agency that is meant to be bipartisan that now is just a one party. One of the things that you missed out on is the sort of pressure testing of the decisions and mm -hmm. the positions that they take. So one of the things that I used to do, so I mentioned, you know, I was at a Republican appointee of the Obama administration. And so for the first part of my tenure, I was always in the minority. But given the sort of FTC ethos of the time, one of the roles that I played was trying, so I remember early on in my tenure, someone came up to me at the, a meeting, a, a event, and they said, so you're up there writing a lot of dissents? And I said, well, you know, I kind of like to win. And like, if you're dissenting, by definition, you're not winning. Um, so I try to engage behind the scenes and move the commission to a position where I don't have to dissent. Um, and I think that that was a really valuable kind of thing because like somebody like Debbie Feinstein, who was the head of the Bureau of Competition under um, Edith Ramirez said, I always felt if we could get Maureen on board, we had like a much better chance of winning, you know, winning this case. Um, so you lose that pressure testing. And then the other thing is you lose some of the dissents, right? So for example, there were cases that I dissented in, which ultimately, uh, there was a, a case early in my tenure where I said on a consumer protection issue, I think there the liability, you know, there's liability here, but I think the FTC's remedy is unconstitutional, and the DC Circuit agreed with me. Uh, a a well-known decision in Qualcomm uh, case right at the end of the Clinton, uh, sorry, of the Obama administration, um, I dissented, and the Ninth Circuit eventually found my way. So you, you have those kinds of things missing missing out when you just have um, you know, one one party rule. All right. Um, so we still have questions to go through, but we're almost out of time. And I want to ask Adam one final question. So Adam, as as an observer of all of this from from a think tank, what kind of grade would you give huh. our independent agencies, huh. and uh, what would they have to do to move up that grade? Uh, I got out of the grading business. Um, it makes this time of year so much more relaxing when you're not on staff. <laughs> um, let me say, I, I can't give them a letter grade, but I'll say the grade that anybody would give the independent commissions depends on what their purpose is. Um, all the good parts about independent commissions at their best, being deliberative, there's more dialogue inside and publicly, it slows things down, but it makes for better policy. That's a really good thing in many ways. It's not what Hamilton would have recognized as energetic execution. But of course, the whole point of these agencies was not, they weren't just executive. They were, as the court famously said, quasi-judicial, quasi-legislative. So the fact that they are going sort of slow and deliberative is a feature, not a bug, if you don't think of them as, as being in the execution business. Um, on the other, I guess I suppose the flip side of that is the independent commissions that are moving very swiftly and unilaterally and ideologically right now. They're very energetic, and I'd have qualms with that too, so they can't win either way. Um, I think one of the challenges for independent commissions going forward in the next 10 years is, and the challenge for the independent, independent commissions and future White Houses is, I think it's inevitable that the White House through OIRA will assert authority over these independent commissions. The things that these commissions are doing is basically what their executive branch counterparts are doing, whether it's the FTC and the Justice Department, whether it's FERC uh, and the EPA, right? Uh, whether it's the SEC and the Treasury Department. There's just so much overlap between the substance and the tools, whether it's rulemaking or enforcement and so on, and of course the policy subjects. And so one of the real challenges for both the White House and for independent commissions is understanding what will OIRA oversight of an independent commission actually look like. When a commission sends a rule up to the White House and the White House sends it back down to the commission for some improvements, how is the deliberative process within the agency actually going to work on that issue? There's a lot of arguments around the independent commissions and OIRA over either the constitutional side of things, or should the president have power over an independent agency like this? There's the subject matter questions. Should the White House be involved in financial regulation? Traditionally, that's been independent. But the sticking point, in addition to all of those, really is the practicalities of an interface between OIRA and a five-member bipartisan commission. And so I hope people who are thinking about these issues start thinking in advance. Inevitably, a White House is going to assert uh, direct oversight over these commissions. 
and we ought to make sure that there's actually a workable procedure for it. All right, well, thank you all very much. So, Maureen, Mike, and Adam, uh, what you provided us has been really valuable. This, this difficulty of sorting through what's the standing, what is the role, what's the nature of an independent agency, how do we ensure rule of law while at the same time allowing people to pivot nimbly when they need to. It's, it's a constant work all over the world, and, and you've done a lot for us to help us think this through today. So thank you all for being here as well. For those of you that are viewing online, um, let us know at AEI what other kinds of things you would like for our scholars to be working on. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to help you with your work as well. So thank you all very much.